Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Michal. I'm a software engineer here at Software Mansion. And as Matik said, I will be uh, talking about Elixir WebRTC. But before we move to the library itself, I would like to go back four years uh, and talk a little bit about my uh, beginnings. So um, four years ago, I joined Software Mansion on, on my summer, uh, summer internship. And uh, this was also the time when um, web, there was a pretty big hype on WebRTC. So a lot of companies, a lot of people wanted to do something with WebRTC. And because we also run our uh, own multimedia framework called Membrane, um, we decided to add support for, uh, for WebRTC uh, in it. So I almost immediately started working uh, on this task. My first, uh, my first task was to create a libnice uh, wrapper for usage in Elixir. And uh, after those four years, I, uh, a lot of things are obvious to me, right? But they were definitely not at that time. So I tried to refresh my memories and uh, I called this slide WebRTC uh, user experience. Uh, so I uh, collected a couple of things that I think make WebRTC difficult uh, when you try to start uh, playing with it. At least those uh, are going to be things that were difficult to me. So first of all, uh, there is a difference between peer-to-peer -peer and SFU scenario. Although WebRTC is a peer-to-peer -peer standard, so you might think that whenever you use it, whether it's client-to-client -client communication or client-to-server communication, you are going to have the same result. You use the same uh, functions. Uh, and, and that's true, but imagine that you have a client that enters some video conferencing room, right? So this client does not know how many audio and video tracks there are on the server side. And the question is how to perform um, session negotiation in this scenario. Uh, we can either send some metadata before the actual negotiation, so server can send some information how many audio and video tracks there are, uh, and client can construct a comprehensive SDP offer, or we can run two uh, peer connections, uh, the first one for sending and the other one for receiving, and run two negotiations in parallel, or we, or we can do just two negotiations, but this will increase the, the whole negotiation process time. Uh, so uh, a lot of questions, uh, seems to appear, and when you start working on WebRTC, you basically don't know whether there's a problem with the standard, or where to look for an answer, or are you missing something, uh, and so on. So this was the first thing to, uh, that, that was difficult to me to understand. And the, the next thing that is also uh, closely related to the previous one is uh, difficult to understand negotiation process, uh, but here I mean Mm, the fact that you have to know what is SDP offer and answer, what are what are ICE candidates, uh, that you have to exchange them. Uh, there are different functions like set local description, set remote description, perfect negotiation, and so on. Uh, next, we have few demo applications. So we have a couple of fully fledged, very comprehensive, complex uh, SFUs. And they are really great, but uh, their code base is really large. So if you want to jump into their, uh, them and see how they work, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, on the other hand, we have a lot of simple, uh, simple examples showing how to use JavaScript API, but they run only on the, on the local side. And there is nothing in between those two, two scenarios, right? There are no simple DM applications that are deployed 24-7. Uh, that would show different negotiation scenarios, different use cases. A few learning resources. Uh, so if you would like to know how the uh, WebRTC API uh, was evolving, uh, how, why do we actually need transceivers? Uh, why can't, you, can't we just operate on tracks? Uh, there are some blog posts, I think, uh, too, uh, from 2017, and it's pretty hard to find them. So uh, if you take a look at MDN documentation, uh, there are not so many so many information in in, the, in this context. A lot of non-standardized things, so simulcast connection probing, bandwidth estimation, all of them are server-side techniques that are not standardized. There are no RFC documents, or they are obsolete, and you actually 
have to come up with something uh, on your own. And poor server-side observability, so we of course have uh, Chrome WebRTC internals, but if you want to have something similar on the server side, you need to use uh, peer connection get stats API. You have to calculate metrics per second on your own because they are not included in the standard. You have to visualize them somehow. So overall, I, I felt like the uh, the entry level was was pretty uh, pretty pretty high. And having all of those uh, in our minds, we decided last year to create a. Uh, a brand new project that we we, we called um, Elixir WebRTC, and we also named this uh, implementation "Batteries Included." So I would like to go, uh, to go through it right now and explain what does it mean to to be batteries included. Uh, this is our website. So uh, once you go there, uh, the very first thing you can uh, see or we we aim uh, to to show are our demo demo applications. I was talking about uh, them. Uh, before and I would like to show them uh, in a while. Uh, just two two words of introduction about the Elixir WebRTC itself. So the first idea was that we wanted to create a project similar to Pion, but for for the Elixir ecosystem, right? But we quickly realized that bringing just WebRTC API into Elixir won't be enough. It's too complex, too low level uh, to um, fascinate uh, other uh, other um, people by it. Uh, so we uh, we change our vision, our idea into creating the whole ecosystem, every everything that you need to create fully functional uh, real-time applications. So let's let's see what does it actually mean uh, to be batteries included. First of all, our um, demo applications uh, right now there are three demo applications, and the purpose is here is pretty easy. We want to show you what can be built with Elixir WebRTC how to integrate with it with other already existing Phoenix, uh, I mean, Elixir uh, frameworks and, and libraries, and how to perform negotiation process in different scenarios. Uh, for example, here we have a recognizer app. It's a simple um, real-time image recognition application. We use uh, Phoenix, which is a web framework for Elixir. Elixir WebRTC and Elixir NX, which is a set of machine learning libraries for Elixir. And uh, every app is available 24-7, uh, so when you check it out, we, can, we will be redirected, for example, to Recognizer. We can see how it works, uh, so it will try to detect image, for example, me, uh, the detection is not always, you know, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's not on our side. Uh, it's on some, you know, uh, machine learning uh, guys. Uh, and yep. Uh, so uh, so so this is, for example, recognizer. And uh, looking at it from uh, session negotiation process, it just sends sim single audio and single video. So it's pretty pretty easy, right? We also have a broadcaster, which is a Twitch-like real-time streaming service. Uh, we implement here Web and Web to show that Elixir WebRTC is fully compatible with uh, both of those protocols. And once again, we check it out. We will see uh, an infinite fake audio and fake video stream running. You can even test your own web clients with our broadcaster. We allow for uh, third-party connections. Um, and Broadcaster is also used today to stream uh, this event uh, under stream.rtcon.live. Um, what else do we have? We have also Nexus, which is a single Google Meet like video conferencing app. Um, so everyone joins the same, the same room. And we also have this not shown here, uh, RHEL, which is our turn server, one instance of it is publicly available for testing and experimental use cases. So those are our demos, and they're finished with a simple uh, simple uh, video showing how you can code Recognizer. So not only do we provide demo applications, but a live coding session showing uh, how to use API, what, why it looks the way it does, and so on. And our features will go through the website because I spent four days implementing it uh, in pure HTML and CSS. So this is my presentation. Uh, 
observability. I said that uh, I said that there is no server side easy observability in Phoenix, a web framework. Uh, I think that other web frameworks too. You uh, you are provided with a built-in dashboard, and what's uh, non-standard, I believe. In Phoenix, you can easily extend it by your own plots and metrics. So uh, let's go back for the to the presentation for a while. Just by adding this single line of code here, additional pages, XWebRTC, XWebRTC dashboard, you will get on the back end an uh, automatic, uh, out of the box, you will get out of the box WebRTC uh, internals, but for the server side. And our dashboard will automatically detect all of the peer connections running uh, and it will visualize uh, those plots, metrics, uh, states of ICE connection, peer connection, what are ICE candidates, and so on, and so on. Yep. Uh, so we also support simulcast for uh, for server side, so uh, multiple inbound resolutions. Uh, there is of course no uh, no project without AI nowadays, so we created a simple wrapper around FFmpeg for audio and video decoding, so you can easily feed your data into uh, Elixir NX, which is, as, as I said, uh, a set of machine learning libraries. Uh, in, in Elixir, this is as simple as uh, writing three lines of code. We can create just a new decoder, pass some codec like VP8, and then just call decode. Uh, we'll get a decoded frame, uh, which can be then converted into a tensor that is ready to be fed into Elixir NX. So just three lines of code, and we are ready to you know do AI stuff. Um, what else do we have? Tutorials. So I said about a few learning resources. In uh, Elixir WebRTC, we created a series of tutorials that aim to introduce you both into WebRTC and Elixir WebRTC. We have both uh, introductory section and advanced section. And for example, here we have something that we call mastering transceivers, where we try to collect everything that we learned when uh, studying W3C specification. Uh, we had a lot of questions, for example, what is possible, what is not possible, what is, for example, a warm-up technique, where you can uh, establish peer-to-peer -peer connection without having uh, access to your audio and video uh, devices. So you basically can, uh, uh, in parallel, start accessing audio and video devices and also uh, establishing peer-to-peer -peer connection. We tried to explain all of this. We wrote JavaScript code counterpart in Elixir WebRTC, so you can see how the API maps uh, between those two languages. There are also uh, JavaScript uh, fiddles prepared, so you can jump easily into the code and, and start playing with it. Uh, there is also debugging section. For example, I think that two, two months ago, I, uh, I discovered someone on the video, sl um, video dev Slack told me that you can uh, dump RTP packets uh, decoded by, by a web browser. Uh, so, for example, for those three years, I didn't know about this. So we included instructions, for example, here, how you can run your web browser, how you can dump those packets and interpret them in Wireshark, and they, they are completely decrypted. And I, I believe this knowledge is pretty hard uh, to find in the internet. When you take Elixir WebRTC, uh, you, uh, you get all of this out of the box in our documentation. Uh, so, so yep, let's get back to, to our website. Uh, demo applications, I mentioned about this membrane ready, so membrane team uh, created sync and source elements uh, for, for membrane, so you can easily use Elixir WebRTC with, uh, with membrane. Whip and, whip and web ready, I mentioned about this already, so you can stream direct, directly from OBS to, to Elixir WebRTC based apps. And a couple of simple examples. So when you move, when we move to, to our repository, not only do we provide you with demo applications, but also with some very simple uh, examples that can be run on your local machine. Uh, for example, a chat, chat application that uses uh, uh, data channels under the hood. So this is more or less what we mean by batteries included. And uh, now I would also like to talk, uh, maybe do some like coding session. So uh, for a couple of last days, I was working on um, live components. 
Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard about server-side rendering. Someone? Okay. <laughs> Some people? Okay. So server-side rendering, as I understand it, is uh, just um, generating HTML on the server side uh, using data we have on the server side and returning the whole ready to be rendered HTML uh, to the to the client, right? And in Phoenix, we not only have the server side rendering, but also real time updates. So whenever data on the backend changes, uh, Phoenix will send using a WebSocket uh, a diff of those changes to the front end that will re-render what changed. So we thought it would be cool to use WebRTC without writing any JavaScript code, uh, so that we can just uh, run WebRTC or create a peer connection just using server-side mm, rendering. Uh, and I would like to show this. So I created, uh, I generated a Phoenix app that is uh, that is a pure Phoenix app, so there is nothing in it. And in Phoenix, we have a, a file called router. So here we just handle our request. In most cases, we just use get, put, delete, and, and stuff like this. I will increase the font maybe. Uh, and for, uh, for live components, so the server-side rendering with live updates, we have a live, live um, let's say, macro. You can think about this as a function. Uh, so uh, whenever someone, someone oops, goes under uh, slash RTC on will be redirected into RTC on web uh, dot uh, live RTC on. So what I'm going to do right now is that I'm going to implement this, this module. So I have uh, created th this file RTC on. This will be pretty easy. We just need to define this module RTC uh, on web uh, dot uh, what it was live RTC on. We have to use a Phoenix live, uh, live view and implement just a single callback. It is called uh, dev render. So it is called when our HTML is going to be rendered, right? So here we can return some, um, some string uh, that, will, that is going to be our, uh, our HTML, right? So we can start, for example, with some, some button. If I, I create a button here, Right, uh, my server is already running, and I I go under localhost slash rtc on. Uh, we should see some some button. Let's add some text a couple of times uh, to be better visible. Okay, so here is our button, right? Um, and now what I would like to try is to create a, a player, uh, a HTML video player that will establish a peer connection be with my server and will be ready to receive data from my server. So I, I have uh, a, a uh, cheat sheet, just, just a single line of code. So in Elixir, we'll do something like this, live component, and we'll specify live XWebRTC player, and that's all. If I create this, if I save this and refresh the page, we'll get uh, the, the error. Uh, I think I have to delete this one. Yep, and now we should be ready. So this is a player. And under the hood, what actually happened is that we created a peer connection on the front end side and on the back end side. Uh, and this, this uh, connection is actually connected. So we can start sending data from uh, backend to, to the server. Uh, we can go to Chrome WebRTC internals uh, and see this. Uh, so this will be uh, our localhost connection. And as you can see, the, the connection state is completed uh, here, uh, right? So uh, this is something that we are working on right now. It's still a work in progress. It's not publicly available. We can. We can do also uh, some uh, some uh, short demo of our dashboard. So, if I go to our router, just to make sure that the, on the backend side it looks uh, the same way. So, if I go to our router and here I add additional uh, pages. So, so this line I was talking about before. Uh, 
and uh, let's say that I refresh the page, then I go uh, to, to our dashboard slash dive slash dashboard. Right, so you will see our WebRTC tab, and this tab uh, also sees the speed connection. The speed connection is connected, right? Uh, we can go even farther and try to create, let's assume that we want to do a broadcasting service, and I want to create 10 uh, such players for, I don't know, 10 streamers. There are 10 streamers, I want to, I want to receive 10 streams. Uh, we, can, we can run this in, in a loop. Uh, and just by adding this single simple simple loop, I can refresh uh, refresh the page. We'll see ten different different players, and uh, on the on the backend side we'll see ten different peer connections. So we actually don't need to write any JavaScript code using uh, Phoenix and Phoenix Live View, or at least I hope we uh, th this uh, this will be possible after we we end our work. And last but not least, um, what's next? Maybe talk what's next. So we would like to, of course, focus on live components for Elixir WebRTC. We would like to add custom support for a live book. This is something like Jupyter Notebooks, but for, for Elixir. And bring Erlang distribution into Broadcaster. Uh, so this is more or less our roadmap. I would uh, also uh, would like to mention uh, Lukas Vala, who was working with me on this project for the first year, but unfortunately he uh, he has to leave us for his studies in Switzerland. And uh, now uh, we are working with Kuba, uh, who was also leading uh, uh, workshops uh, two days ago. So the team, our team, uh, consists of two people uh, all the time. And uh, a small announcement that uh, in the third week of October, we are going to uh, organize Elixir Stream Week. This will be five days where every day someone for, from the Elixir community is going to run a stream on broadcaster uh, software. We, we invited uh, uh, a couple of known uh, people from, from Elixir world. So uh, if you are interested in Elixir and WebRTC, and uh, maybe not only WebRTC, then it would be nice if you if you joined us. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Are there any questions? Mateusz Tom. If there was one thing that you can change in the WebRTC standard to make it simpler for early adopters or for, and for learning, what would it be? Well, um, I think that the WebRTC is a great standard and we just need better <laughs> implementations. So just uh, we just needed Elixir WebRTC. <laughs> so you wouldn't change anything? In the exactly. <laughs> but uh, talking uh, seriously, well, uh, I think that uh, the problem is not with the standard itself, but uh, with how it is presented to the user. So if you go to MDN documentation, uh, you actually are not able to learn uh, those uh, those things I was talking about. You, you just need to dive into the standard or try them on your own. I believe that there are no answers to those questions I asked today, for example, how to establish uh, this, this, this um, session uh, in server-side scenarios. At least I don't know what is the correct way. I know that different uh, uh, servers do this in different ways. For example, uh, if I recall correctly, LiveKit just opens, for example, two peer connections. We we open a single peer connection and send some metadata. Um, I believe that also Janus for some time was opening two peer connections, but I'm not sure whether for this reason or some other. Uh, so, yep, maybe talking just to developers from Google. Any other questions from the audience? So there will be one question from me. Uh, maybe I've, I've missed uh, the fact, but uh, WebRTC is not just audio and video. There are also data channels. Are data channels already included in the version that is released? Yep, so a couple of days ago we released version 0 0.5, and in this version we included support for data channels. So they are fully supported right now in, in our implementation. Cool. All 
All right, unless there are any further questions, let's thank Michal again for this talk. Thank you.